Please take your Bibles and again, be turning with me and follow along as I go to Psalm 100. Psalm 100. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. For the Lord is good, his loving kindness is everlasting, and his faithfulness to all generations. Today we come, as we've been pursuing a study in the Psalms, following along in the scripture reading, which many in our congregation are pursuing, we come from a much longer longer psalms that we have considered, some of them 60 and 70 verses in length, recounting the goodness of God to the people of Israel as they were led through the wilderness wanderings and even into the promised land, but yet how they fought against him. Today, we come to a much briefer psalm, just five verses But let me remind you that the most favorite psalm, Psalm 23, is simply six verses. Sometimes these tight, condensed, packed, full verses, they draw us. They bring us to a place of worship. They open our eyes to things that we have not seen before. Yes, we delight to have an elaborate explanation of the goodness of God and to be filled in on some of the detail, but never, never despise those portions and those psalms which are ever so tiny. One of the favorite books of the New Testament for me is Philemon, where the Apostle Paul writes this tiny little letter to Philemon to plead on behalf of a servant, Onesimus. I delight in that because it speaks to us of the grace of God, whereas rights could be exercised, there are certain places of position and things that could be done But Paul, and this is so like our Lord and Savior, he pleads with Philemon, extend grace, extend a gracious hand to Onesimus when he comes back. Here, so tightly compacted, five verses, and let's just delight in what we have here and consider the truth that is compacted here and which we can benefit by. Shout joyfully to the Lord. We've heard such expressions before where we are bid to worship the Lord, but here it is not simply the covenant people of God that are told that they ought to do this very thing, to shout joyfully to the Lord that there is to be an exuberance, that there is to be a rejoicing in the heart, but it is directed to all the earth, the whole earth. Humanity and all of creation is bid to rejoice in our God for who he is and for his loving kindness which goes beyond anything that we deserve, anything that we could rightly expect. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. You see, God is not simply interested in the well-being 
of those who willingly serve him. But our God, he deserves the praise of all the earth. He is not simply interested in a little postage size state of Israel and the land which he had promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But God, he rightly deserves, it is due to him, it is due him all of the praise of the earth. And so, in this psalm of thanksgiving, as the inscription is given, we are told that we should shout joyfully to the Lord all the earth, and that we are to serve the Lord with gladness. I'm sure that that has not always been your experience. It certainly hasn't always been my experience. Sometimes we simply don't serve the Lord. We have other plans and we have other ideas of the direction that we want to go and we have gone there. There are then those times which we serve the Lord. We say, okay, Lord, I would really like to go over there, but I'm going to stay here and I'm going to serve you. But Lord, really, everything within me yearns to go to another place. I think I would be happier there but I'm just going to hold steady here. I'm just going to hunker down and hold fast. Well, the Lord, he desires us to be obedient, but with a glad, with an exuberant heart as well. He would not want us to feel that we are under such heavy compulsion to serve him, but rather that we be those love servants of his. Serve the Lord with gladness, we are bid. Come before him with joyful singing. I trust that when you sing the songs of Zion and of the Lamb, that there is indeed within your heart a gladness, a joy at what God has done for you, that you as with Lazarus, you were dead. Lazarus was physically dead, but each and every one of us, according to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, dead in our trespasses and sins. Those things where we dwelt. We were living in a graveyard. We were enveloped in a casket. We were dead and buried and without hope, but God, through Jesus Christ in his grace, he has come and he has bid that we live. How could we not serve him with gladness? How could we not come before him with joyful singing? How could Lazarus, after he was raised from the dead, we know that he and his sisters that they were good friends of Jesus even before that time. How much more would the heart of Lazarus just go out to Jesus? How much more of a delight there would be in being in the presence of Jesus? Rejoice. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. Verse 3 takes us back to Genesis. It says, no, no. We've been told to shout, to serve, to come. Those things are outward expressions. A person who is shouting, they're, they're not hard to identify. Oh, right over there. The loudest person in the crowd. Or a person who is going about their service as a servant in an ancient home would go and wash the feet. Well, there, there's the, there's the servant. Someone who comes, they have moved themselves in a physical way from one place to another. 
they are, that's an outward expression. They are easily identified. But now we go to the inside of a person, to the inside of you and me, and we are told, no, know that the Lord himself is God. Let it get into the fabric of your being. Let it permeate. Every fiber ought to know this. It ought to be imprinted on the DNA of every cell. No. It should be a computer code that is written inside of us. Know that the Lord himself is God. What are the options, or what is the flip to this? The flip is that we are God, and that we are the power through which we live. That is by the brains that we have, and it's by the strength of our arms that we provide for ourselves, or that it's through connections that we have made, and so, in fact, in that way, we become the God of our own making and the God of ourselves. We become divine. But the psalmist, he is saying, that is not accurate. No, he says, that the Lord himself is God. It is his doing that we are here, he has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Two things are taking place there in verse 3. Know that the Lord is God. He is the one who has made us. But he did not simply make us and say, now, the assembly line is continuing to run, and I need to stay here at my place, and I need to continue to make humans as they go along the production line and get spit out into the world. God is not simply the one who makes us. He is not the one who forms, not only the one who forms and fashions us, but he is the one who continues to be watching over us every moment of every day that we take breath. We are his people. We are his very own, every last one of us. Whether we serve him gladly, willingly, with joyful shouting, whether we know, in fact, that he is God and that he has made us and that it wasn't anything of our own doing, whether we know that and whether we accept it or whether we are rebels, whether we fight and kick and resist his wooing and his spirit, yet we are his people. But there is also a divide here. The psalmist says we are his people and the sheep of his pasture there are many people in this world, they are gods only by creation, not by redemption. By creation only and not by redemption. God has made each and every last one of us and we bear his image, though horribly marred. We are his by creation. And for that reason, we owe to him allegiance. We owe him honor. We owe him praise for how great he is. We are his. But not everyone has come under redemption. Not everyone has fallen down before him and said, Lord, I realize how marred I am. I realize that I have fought and kicked, that I have resisted your spirit. Lord, make me one of your people, not just of creation, but of redemption 
as well. Make me a sheep of your pasture. God is the God of all, and so all the earth should shout joyfully to this one who has made us. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Are we the sheep of his pasture, even those who are only his by means of his creation? I would say yes, indeed. We are. You see, the, the Lord, he causes the rain to fall on the wicked and the good. He causes the sun to shine on the fields of both those who rebel against him and who serve him gladly. You see, the Lord extends his kindness. He is providing his feed. He is providing all of his good gifts to the world, desiring that through his patience, through his long-suffering, through his forbearance, that men and women would come to repentance and that they would bow and say, Lord, I realize my eyes have finally been opened to see what I have never seen before. That the goodness which I took for granted, that the kindness that I thought was because of my own endeavors was really because of what you have done for me. A person at that point, they cross over from simply being a child of God and of one who worships the Lord simply because they are created by his hand and they become a child of God and a part of God's pasture, part of his fold. Verse 4 says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. So as you look to the first word of each verse, we've had shout, serve, and come, know, and here we have the invitation, enter, enter. Shout, serve, come, and know, and enter into all of the goodness of God how many enter in just so far that they might have some of the blessings of God, that they might participate, that they might have a taste of some of God's goodness. But the psalmist would want us to enter in hook, line, and sinker. Hook, line, and sinker. Every last bit Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Praise that is rightly, perfectly due to him. Give thanks to him and bless his name. And here comes really the rationale for all that we have had to this point. Verse 5 and the conclusion. For the Lord... What is his character? The Lord is good. Goodness is defined by God. What is good is what God is. It is not that we define what God is and we hold it up and we say, yep, yeah, God, God meets the qualifications and God, therefore, is good. We determine that what God is, is good. That is who he is. That is him and himself to the very center of his being. The Lord is good. His loving kindness, it's everlasting. It doesn't end. Just when you think that his kindness, his love, his loving kindness when you put those two together, it doesn't get any better than that. The love of God mixed with the kindness of God, his loving kindness, it rolls on and on and on. One day, a man came 
to Jesus and said, how many times should my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Seven times perhaps? And Jesus said, no, not seven times, but rather 70 times seven. That's incredible. Now, if we were nitpicky, we would say, well, 490, and so if, if he sins against me in one day, 491 times, do you mean that I can really let him have it? Jesus is saying, just forget about the count. Just continue to pour out grace and forgiveness. And God does not ask of us what he has not already done. The Lord is good. His loving kindness, it rolls on and it goes forward and it advances and it's just as deep as it ever was before. We take a spoonful out of the ocean and is the ocean diminished thereby? Certainly not. Here, just the same in the loving kindness of God. We dip into it. We take a measure out. But is it diminished? Not at all. The Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting. And his faithfulness to all generations. The goodness of God, the faithfulness of God, the loving kindness of God it continues to roll forward. And what we say is praise his holy name. Praise his name. And we come back to the beginning and we say all the more, shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Bow with me in prayer, please. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for Psalm 100 and the message which is given for us. So may this lay hold of us today, that in the midst of struggles and trials, difficulties of all different kinds, that our hearts and that our eyes would be so set upon you. Know that the Lord is God and that he is watching over us. Lord, so let it be that this would be our confidence, our delight, what gladdens our heart and which causes us to move forward and to enter into all of your goodness. So hear us, Lord, and receive praise, honor, and glory, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen.